people seem to be rather enthusiastic about the prospects of colonising the moon in just the next few years, and Mars, perhaps by about 2030. Which of these options is better in the immediate future really depends on what we expect in the short term and the long term. It also depends on what this colonisation will involve. Humanity has become fairly good at sending robotic spacecraft to numerous places in our solar system, but this is not the same as landing and retrieving living humans, and so we need to be careful about our next steps. Keeping humans alive and functional in a viable colony won't be easy on either the Moon or Mars, and a colony on the Moon in just a few years seems extremely optimistic. And even just landing live humans on Mars and bringing them back to Earth also alive by 2030 seems extraordinarily ambitious and building an actual ongoing human colony is vastly more complicated. One sensible place to start making plans for this is which to aim for first. This requires some thought, because both of these destinations will really only be stepping stones, and they obviously have to be successful ones. Both the Moon and Mars will present some daunting obstacles, some of them the same in both cases, others unique to each. There are a lot of things to consider, some of them being distance and time of transport, supply and resupply, physical risks, habitat construction, maintenance, rescue if necessary and even possible, and simply the risk of going crazy in a tightly confined alien environment. Let us look at these obstacles and see where they lead us. Humans are, by any measure, an invasive, radiating species. All organisms are, generally speaking, unless and until they hit some kind of adaptive wall. In our case, with regard to continuing space exploration, there are two chains of thought. On one hand, we expand inexorably, because our population swells, and because we are insatiably curious, and are captivated by a romantic notion of sending humans into unknown places in our universe. On the other hand, while life on Earth has adapted to some very strange and extreme conditions here on Earth, we are in no way, shape or form capable of surviving for more than mere seconds in the conditions on the Moon or Mars. Yet we want to start populating the rest of our star system, at least to whatever extent we can. We will certainly attempt this, and so we need to deal with the practicalities of the matter. This is of course utterly impossible for us, without extensive and sophisticated technology, and we need to learn these technologies under increasingly realistic conditions. There is an extraordinarily long list of concerns we need to address before we attempt anything as ambitious as an extraterrestrial colony. We are not even close to managing many of these concerns at the moment. Here is a quick overview of just a few of the bigger ones. Biological hazards of space travel have become increasingly clear since the Apollo program, and with the sustained occupation of the International Space Station, especially Scott Kelly's near year on the ISS, astronauts on the ISS for prolonged periods experience some worrisome effects on their musculoskeletal systems, neurological systems, vascular systems, genomes and more. Comparing Scott Kelly's biology with that of his twin brother, the retired astronaut Mark Kelly can only yield limited information because of the sample size, but is nonetheless alarming. Scott experienced a variety of changes to multiple organ systems, some of which may be chronic, but we don't know enough yet to be certain. It is important to keep in mind that these occurred in low Earth orbit, and in microgravity conditions. Apollo astronauts also experienced some physical effects on their trips to the Moon and back, but these trips were only a matter of days, a sustained presence on either the Moon or Mars, and the trip durations of simply getting to Mars and back, present biological challenges that are daunting. Radiation is an extremely worrisome problem, since there is no real practical way at present to adequately shield space travellers from this. And a second radiation, the radiation caused when cosmic radiation ionises the materials the spacecraft is made of, is also a potential problem.
How do we build long-term habitats on either the Moon or Mars? Shipping all the materials we need from Earth even to the Moon is nearly impossible, and practically impossible in the case of Mars. And to even build these habitats would require workers already there, either humans or very sophisticated robots. There are various possibilities for habitats, including temporary inflatable structures pre-sent to specified sites, to ambitious proposals to somehow process local materials like regolith into construction materials, and even ideas to use 3D printers to build components of habitats using processed materials on the Moon or Mars. However, inflatable habitats would be vulnerable to penetration by micrometeoroids, and processing local materials would take time and considerable technology. Another possibility would be to use existing lava tubes, which are present on both the Moon and Mars, as habitats reinforced as necessary. This would alleviate the problem of radiation to a significant degree for those within these areas. Needless to say, they would still need to be oxygenated, heated, lighted, and pressure and humidity controlled. Temperature extremes are considerable on both the Moon and Mars, which would not only be a risk to any human occupants, they would also present problems for any machinery on the surface. This means that habitat locations would have to be carefully chosen to minimise these temperature swings. There are possible locations at the south polar region of the Moon, and also at various places on Mars. Colonists will have to produce their own food, and so an abundant source of light and temperature regulation will be necessary for both the food sources and the colonists. Water and oxygen would also have to be locally sourced. We know that both the Moon and Mars have abundant supplies of water, but there would need to be processing centres for converting the ice to water, and for separating the water molecules into hydrogen and oxygen. There would also have to be power sources, perhaps solar, hydrogen separated from water, or perhaps nuclear, and the needs for power, oxygen and water would be immediate. So too would be the need for food. Eventually, any colonies would have to become largely, if not entirely, self-sufficient, and fairly rapidly. Although the Moon is only three days away, the cost of shipping any supplies would be enormous. Mars, however, is many months distance from Earth, so regularly resupplying a Mars colony would be profoundly impractical, if not impossible. There would, needless to say, have to be a significant number of engineers and technicians to maintain and repair any of the technology needed at either location. On Mars, the communication delay would make addressing any true emergencies difficult or impossible from Earth. Another consideration, which took the Apollo teams by surprise, is that moon dust proved to be significantly damaging and insidious. It appeared to infiltrate everywhere, and adhered to most surfaces. This dust, since it was subjected to very little erosion, was sharp and glassy, difficult or impossible to clean away, and infiltrated the lander and then the command module. Martian dust is probably not this bad, but we don't know for certain. We know that any moon inhabitants would have to deal with dust constantly, but we don't know yet how much of a problem Martian dust will present. The rovers there have seemed to operate acceptably, although solar panels became covered with dust, and Martian dust storms are notoriously immense and long-lasting. We don't know what an entire colony may have to deal with. Finally, there is the delicate matter of waste disposal, in particular human waste in the forms of urine and faeces. Urine on the ISS has already been regularly processed by the American section of the station into drinking water, and there are fairly well advanced experiments into converting faeces into a consumable food source, but we have no idea how much of this diet could be tolerated by colonists, or if it might have any long-term deleterious effects. As mentioned, the ISS is in low Earth orbit, and experiences microgravity, although it is shielded from radiation by the Earth's magnetic field. The ISS orbits at a distance of about 248 miles, or 400 kilometers, above the Earth, whereas Earth's magnetosphere extends an average of 40,000 miles, or 65,000 kilometers, with considerable variation due to solar wind above the Earth's surface. This means, in all likelihood, that physiological and neurological problems astronauts develop aboard the SS are largely due to low gravity conditions there. Any colonists on the Moon and Mars will experience very low gravity conditions for very extended periods of time, perhaps years in the case of Mars. And so we need to develop ways to counter the muscular and skeletal degeneration. The changes in blood pressure in different parts of the body, the alterations in major blood vessels that may predispose astronauts to strokes, 
the apparent cognitive degeneration, sometimes observed, and numerous other changes, including genetic alterations. On the Moon on Mars, however, in addition to their extremely weak gravitational fields, they also lack magnetospheres, and as a result, colonists will be exposed to significant solar and cosmic radiation. Since we have no way of ethically testing what will happen to humans under such conditions, we have no choice but to try as hard as we can to ensure that any feasible shielding measure we devise will in fact be adequate. Remember that any shielding will add weight to the already enormously expensive active launching vehicles, large enough to contain a group of humans in space. Lava tubes mentioned earlier could be an effective way of addressing this problem. These are just a few of the numerous problems we will have to solve in any effort to colonise, in any meaningful sense of the word, a different celestial body. There are many others, including the physiological strain of being cooped up with the same small group, and the effects of living in such alien environments for extended periods. When the Apollo 11 astronauts were released from their 21-day quarantine, after having spent six days together in space and on the moon, Neil Armstrong mentioned that it was not something he'd like to do on a regular basis. In 2016, Chris McKay, a planetary scientist at the NASA Ames Research Center, was asked by Popular Science if, if we should first try to colonize the moon, or skip right to Mars. He answered, in part, that to him, the moon was about as exciting as a chunk of concrete. But he also said that it would be an ideal stepping stone to Mars, because everything we'll need to know how to do on Mars is also something we'll have to learn how to do on the much closer moon. The moon is a blueprint to Mars, to him, there was no competition. Go to the moon first, and figure out how to do all of these things as perfectly as possible. Some place that's just a few days away. The problems of establishing a colony elsewhere in our planetary system are truly enormous. And what has been said about it in this video barely scratches the surface. Alien worlds may seem romantic, and perhaps beautiful in various ways, but they are profoundly deadly to humans. We need to be as absolutely certain as possible that we know how to survive elsewhere in our system, and nothing beats practice at anything difficult. The American space program, from Apollo to the space shuttle, killed people. The Soviet space program certainly did as well, although this is generally not acknowledged by them. The American program was so rushed in order to beat the Soviets to the moon that the former NASA engineer once said that if the Apollo program had continued, we would have lost more people in that program alone. We cannot afford a rush return to the moon in a few years, or plant humans on Mars in just 10 years, much less establish permanent presences on these bodies in the near future. Yet, these timelines are currently being pushed. I guess only time will really tell what happens in our enduring search and plans for expanding humans beyond our pale blue dot.